And let me know, Ben, when you think we're live. Will do. Okay, we're all good. Great, thank you very much and good morning, everyone. I am State Senator Mark Lawrence, and this is a uh, public hearing of the Joint Standing Committee on Energy, Utilities, and Technology. Um, with me this morning are the members of the uh, committee, and I'm gonna first allow my co-chair, uh, Representative Seth Berry, to introduce himself. Good Seth morning, Barry. everyone. Uh, my name is Seth Berry, and I represent House District 55, which is Bowdoin, Bowdenham, almost all of Richmond, and beautiful Swan Island on the Kennebec, where you can uh, walk across the ice and, and, and visit now if you're careful, but I don't recommend it too much longer. Great. And now I'm going to go around the uh, virtual horseshoe to introduce, uh, allow members of the committee to introduce themselves and to tell us what district they represent. Um, so I'll start off with uh, our Republican House lead, uh, Representative Wadsworth. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, everyone. My name is Nate Wadsworth, and I represent District 70, Southern Oxford County. Great. And I'll go on to uh, Representative Chad Grignan. Chad? I think you're still muted, Chad. I think we may have you now. Try it. Oh, yep, yeah, we got you, Chad. You got me? Yeah. Okay. Good morning, uh, Representative Chad Grignon, Representative District 118, Athens, Harmony, Stolen, uh, Bingham, north up into the Moose River Valley. Great. And I will go on to uh, Representative Barb Wood. Good morning. Hi, I'm Barb Wood, and I represent House District 38, which is the western end of the peninsula in Portland. Great. And then on to Representative Chris Kessler. Good morning. I am Chris Kessler, representing District 32, which is a portion of South Portland and a little smidgen of Cape Elizabeth. Great, and as we're going through, before we do that, I just have one question for our analyst, uh, Deirdre. You indicated you sent me the morning an updated script for uh, the public hearings. Yes. But when I look in there, it's, it's, it's the schedule. Is the script also attached? It was a separate email. Um, I'll resend it to you if you'd like me to. Thank you, that'd be great, thank you. Uh, just for the public's information, we're updating the script we normally do for public hearings to reflect the uh, Zoom technology and the information we want to give you. Um, I will go on to uh, Representative Ziegler. Uh, good morning, everyone. I am Paige Ziegler. I represent District 96, the seven towns in Walter County of Belmont, Liberty, Lincolnville, Muffo, Morrill, Palermo, and Searsmont. Now we're on to Representative Grohowski. Good morning all, I'm Nicole Grohowski. I represent House District 132, which is the city of Ellsworth in the town of Trenton. And then on to Representative Kessler. Another bite at the apple here. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, I'm doing it. You must have- But I'm Chris Kessler representing District 32 which is a portion of South Portland uh, and a little smidgen of Cape Elizabeth, just in case you forgot. And Representative Carlo. Good morning, Representative Carlo from District 16, which is part of Buxton, all of Hollis and part of Saco. Good to be with you. And Representative Foster. Good morning, my name is Steve Foster. I'm House Representative for District 104 which includes the towns of Garland, Exeter, Stetson, Charleston, and Dexter. Thank you. And then Senator uh, Vitelli. Good morning. I'm Eloise Vitelli. I represent Senate District 23, which is all 10 towns in Saginaw County and the town of Dresden in Lincoln County. Great. And I believe that concludes um, going around the virtual horseshoe. And uh, 
Representative Kessler must have changed his seat during our presentation, and that's why I had to do him twice in the uh, virtual horseshoe. Um, so I just wanted to go over with you our procedures for public hearings. Um, so um, the committee is assembled electronically today for the purpose of inviting public comment on legislation. And before we get started, I just wanna share some information related to the fact that this meeting is being conducted using an electronic format. This meeting is currently being live streamed on the committee's YouTube channel. This means that anyone who is a participant in the meeting via Zoom can be seen and also heard if their microphone is unmuted. People on the Zoom meeting waiting to testify cannot be seen or heard until they are called upon to speak. This meeting will be recorded and available to view on the committee's YouTube channel soon after the meeting has concluded. In a moment, I will have, uh, well, actually, I've already asked the committee members uh, to introduce themselves. So we're go, we'll go on from that part of the introduction. Um, if, um, excuse me, if your name on your Zoom square is not the name you use to register to testify, it may be a bit of a challenge for us to identify you. For example, if you're registered as John Smith or Mary Jones and your Zoom says iPhone 6 or dad's laptop, it would take an extra effort to get, your, uh, to get you to our virtual podium. Please be patient. You should also know that it may, be, may momentarily appear as though you have been dropped from the meeting when we call you up to speak. It takes a second or two, but rest assured you will reappear and you will then be able to provide your testimony. This format is new to all of us and we ex expect that there will be unforeseen glitches and mistakes. Please be patient, we are doing our best and we will all learn as we go along, hopefully uh, to improve uh, the way these virtual hearings work. Thank you. A reminder to members of the committee about the Zoom chat function. This, is a function. this function is not to be used for substantive discussion by anybody. Uh, you should know that the chat window can be viewed by any person taking part in the meeting as a participant. Participants will include members of the committee, staff, and any members of the public during the time uh, they have been promoted to participate for the purpose of providing testimony to the committee. All questions of the person testifying shall be made through the chair. So please don't post a question in the chat room to the person testifying. For each bill heard today, I or my co-chair, but in this case, my co-chair will be presenting the bill, so he will not be able to, will call on the sponsors and the co-sponsors to speak first. When called upon, they will be promoted from attendee to participant. After the presentation by sponsors and co-sponsors, we will call on members of the public uh, based upon how they are registered to testify. If you are registered for the bill, we'll call on you first, against the bill second, or neither for nor against the bill, but wishing to provide additional information, you will testify third. When you are called upon, please make sure that your microphone is not on mute. I will ask you to state your name, your place of residence and your organization uh, you represent, if any. <clears throat> Excuse me. After you are done speaking and there are no more questions from the members, I or the co-chair will return you to attendee and call upon the next person to uh, register to testify. If you are not participating in any other hearings or work session after testifying, please exit the meeting and watch the remainder of the hearing on the committee's YouTube channel after you are returned to attendee status. If you need to exit the meeting before being called upon to testify, Please be aware that you uh, may submit written testimony at any time 
by accessing the legislature's submission page uh, on www.legislature.maine.gov. Uh, uh, some final reminders, this meeting is being broadcast and recorded on YouTube. You can also be heard over the legislature's audio broadcast system. Any testimony you submit will be public and may be posted on the legislature's website. You will have, for people testifying for or against or neither for nor against, you will have three minutes to speak and we will let you know when it's your time to start. And just as a reminder to people of you, uh, for the public speaking for, against, or neither for nor against, if you test up, uh, if you step up, have your testimony, um, you're asked questions, and then you step down, um, you do not have an opportunity to step back up when other people are testifying to answer questions. Um, once you've completed that, you're done with your testimony, but you always have the ability to submit written answers to anything you hear in the rest of the hearing um, to the committee. And you can also come to our work session and submit materials for the work session to respond to their questions. And the purpose of that is not to cut you off or not to uh, prevent additional information. The point is to uh, allow these public hearings to go expeditiously uh, through the process. Um, we'll have over 200 bills probably this session. If we have uh, you know, 10, 20 people testifying on each bill, each hearing is gonna take a significant amount of time and we need to get through those public hearings so we can move on to the work sessions uh, so we can actually work on the bill and then report them out to the legislature. Um, we're on very strict time crunches usually in the legislature to get these out bills out in a matter of months. So that's why we put the uh, limitations on uh, testimony. Okay. I'll now turn to our first bill. And we're pleased today to have uh, our co-chair, uh, my co-chair be the uh, sponsor of the bill. And um, I'll recognize uh, Representative Seth Berry for the purposes of introducing LD and you're gonna have to help me with the number Seth because uh, I don't have it up on my screen right now. 251. 251, and yep. he will announce the title of the bill. Go ahead, Seth. Great, and just for the purpose of uh, everyone um, who's um, you know, uh, watching and, and uh, perhaps waiting to testify, we will be taking these in numerical order. So 251, 285, and then 314. Um, so with that, uh, Senator Lawrence, fellow members of the Energy Utilities and Technology Committee. Um, my name is still Seth Berry, and today I'm pleased to present uh, LD 251, which is an act regarding public utility assessments, fees, and penalties. Uh, this bill will look very familiar to those of you who were with us uh, on the committee last session. Um, that's because the 129th um, was uh, poised to pass this legislation. I believe it had passed the House and was uh, in the Senate when we unfortunately had to adjourn uh, due to the pandemic uh, in March. Uh, so this is the same language that uh, the bipartisan committee report had supported. Uh, thanks to all of you who were there then and supported it and are, are still serving on the committee. Uh, I, I hope we can um, get back to this uh, bill and move it forward. Um, just uh, for, for everyone's purposes, uh, especially uh, those who are new to it, uh, what LD251 would do is essentially update uh, funding for our uh, regulatory activities to protect Maine's utility customers uh, and the natural resources that, that we depend on uh, from, um, I, I, this, I, I use this uh, phrase advisedly, but, but it's, it's really what regulators have to do um, from abuse uh, by uh, monopolies who, who you know, would otherwise control the market. The, the, the nature of the regulatory exercise is to impose the discipline uh, that the free market otherwise would. So um, I'm not suggesting that, that abuse is necessarily occurring. I'm suggesting that the purpose of regulators is to make sure it doesn't. Um, and the bill better protects our rights to affordable clean energy and clean water, as well as other necessities like rural telephone service. And the way it does this, and this is the most important concept here, is to apply basic cost causation principles. In other words, those who cause the costs uh, should pay for them. 
Um, the Public Utilities Commission and the Office of the Public Advocate incur costs um, for their regulatory activity through a mix of three things, fees, penalties, and assessments. And um, the, the fees and penalties are paid for by the, the, the filing party, typically, um, you know, for example, a, a certificate of public convenience and necessity requires a fee. Uh, a penalty might be incurred if, if um, something is, is, is not done um, legally. Um, assessments, the last piece, is an extra charge on our utility bills. Uh, so we pay for that regulatory activity as customers. And um, my perception is that over the years, uh, because the fees and penalties have been set at a dollar amount and have not kept up with inflation, in many cases, these are fixed amounts from 50 years ago, um, we're, we're kind of more relying on the assessment piece that we all pay for, um, rather than uh, the piece that is caused by the cost causer. Uh, this cost shift is bad, obviously, for ratepayers, and it's especially impactful for our lower income Mainers because um, as the public advocate found in a report uh, that came out in uh, the fall of 2019, um, low income Mainers already pay one of the highest energy cost burdens in the nation. On average, uh, someone who is uh, subsisting on uh, 16,000 a year, for example, is paying $4,000 per year in energy costs. Uh, that's all energy costs, including petroleum, but um, it's a high amount. So as we shift to clean energy, we need to be very conscious of that um, very high burden. It's five times uh, uh, what is what is typical uh, for Mainers. Um, the, the burden the burden as a portion of income is five times um, what the typical Mainer pays. Um, so we need to make sure this is equitable. Um, the TND world um, does uh, require a lot, and uh, I'm sorry, transmission and, and, and distribution. So, so electrical utilities um, require the majority of the PUC and the public advocates time. Um, investor owned utilities are, are obviously, a, I know 95% of, of, of that world. In water, um, it's almost the opposite that is true, but investor-owned utilities have been um, expanding in Maine, notably recently in Biddeford and Saco, um, where um, a, a ver some very substantial proceedings have incurred um, some spikes in, uh, in costs for the PUC. And that's been passed on to, to ratepayers across the water utility space, including in the, um, the nonprofit uh, utilities, some of them very small, who uh, frankly struggle when they're surprised with a, a significant assessment. Um, that happened. In fact, that that is what the genesis of this bill, that uh, the water um, utilities came to me expressing concern about sudden uh, impact. And um, it is it is the genesis of the bill. Um, I do want to suggest that we may want to amend the bill further to, to really try to get at that um, sort of sudden and severe impact, um, and we can talk about that more. Um, <clears throat> but just going back to fees and penalties, as I said, they're not keeping up with inflation. So, um, so it, it, to 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 reorganize for a merger or acquisition um, or reorganization of a utility that involves the change in control. Um, in in recent um, in recent years, uh, the PUC has spent and just the PUC, not the public advocate, but the PUC has spent in the vicinity of a quarter of a million dollars uh, to oversee uh, and, 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 and scrutinize and permit, um, in, in each case they did permit, um, the uh, reorganization of large utilities. That includes Maine Water that I mentioned earlier, um, which was in that ballpark. And also it includes um, Versant, um, the most recent reorganization of a large TND. Um, so, Quarter million dollars, not a small amount, and um, the 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 fee uh, to apply for such a permit, the maximum that the PUC is allowed to charge right now is one fifth of that amount. So who pays the rest of it? We do. The customer does, not the uh, filing party. Um, in the last twenty years, uh, in fact, just the time that I've been on the committee less than that, um, we've seen uh, mergers or acquisitions of very, very large value in the billions. Um, Bangor Hydro first by Amera and then by Versant, uh, CMP by Energy East and then by Iberdrola and then by Avantgrid, uh, Iberdrola, even a further reorganization there involving United Illuminating. 
uh, Verizon um, was acquired by Fairpoint and then by Consolidated. You know, the list goes on. These are very large, very complex, um, and very uh, high value transactions. They require a lot of time on the part of our regulators to scrutinize and to, to protect the, the public interest. So big picture, um, you know, we're all captive customers of our utility, whoever that utility is, whether it's consumer owned or investor owned. And, um, and, and we are all being uh, forced to, to pay more um, to help uh, increasingly distant investors apply for permits, do restructuring deals. To, and the reason they do it is to benefit their business. It's not, it's not done for charity, right? So um, let's be clear. Uh, the previous legislature um, was ready to pass this bill. And um, I, uh, I think the logic that we all agreed upon at the time was to, we wanna make sure that the, those who are responsible for costs of regulation are the ones who pay those costs. Um, but this bill does another thing as well, bringing up the, um, it, it asks the PUC to report back to us on fees and penalties in, so that we can be aware of what needs to be updated uh, for inflation. The, um, the, the, the idea here is to, you know, look at that $50,000 uh, fee that I mentioned for reorganization and say, you know, um, that needs to come up, but also others like it. Um, and, and in the case of the 50,000 uh, fee, I, in the, the bill does actually address that. It, it shifts that to a portion, 0.05% of the value of the reorganization. So in the case of, um, you know, uh, the, the recent reorganization um, by uh, CMP, for example, I believe it would be in the ballpark of a quarter of a million dollars. Um, so the idea here is to protect the public interest in an increasingly complex utility world. Um, these, uh, these, these goods, electricity, water, um, are, are, I think, basic human rights at this point, um, certainly necessities, and they need to be kept affordable. Um, they are a public good, whether the utility is private or public, we call them public utilities. And um, they're also key to our climate future. Um, you know, we all understand, I think having seen Texas, uh, the importance of our utilities um, as increasingly severe weather events come our way. And as we shift to uh, more and more of our um, energy use to our electricity um, utilities. So this is about fairness. It's about uh, making an equitable transition to clean energy and um, making sure that the cost causer pays. Thank you for the opportunity to testify and I'm happy to try to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Representative Barry. And uh, there are no co-sponsors on this bill, uh, but we will go to questions first for Representative Barry. So give me a minute. There's a little bit of delay when people on the committee raise their hand. And just as a reminder to people who maybe have been promoted to participant, um, it's only committee members uh, who can ask questions during public hearings. Um, and I see Representative Grohowski with her hand raised. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Barry, for bringing this bill back. Um, <clears throat> I just, I haven't had time to do a compare and contrast, but I'm curious, is this language we're looking at the final language that the committee reported out last session? Yes, it is. Thank you for that question. Are there other questions from the committee? Representative Kessler, raising your hand both virtually and, and personally doesn't mean you get to speak twice. Representative Kessler. Can everybody hear me okay? Great. Um, I just uh, on the same note, could you please tell me what the LD was from last session? Uh, I should have that close at hand and I'm terrible with LD numbers, um, but thank you for the question anyway. I think I wanna say it was 1881 and maybe our analyst can, um, well, she wasn't with us at the time, but I, I think it was 1881. I'll double check. Thank you. And I must say Representative Barry, it's actually frightening that you would remember the number <laughs> of the bill. Is there anybody else on the committee who wishes to ask a question? Seeing none, uh, we're now gonna go to uh, proponents. And the first person I'll recognize is Deb Hart from the Dirigo Electric Cooperative speaking in favor of the bill. Good 
Good morning, Senator Lawrence, Representative Barry, and members of the Utilities Committee. My name is Deborah Hart. I'm a resident of Manchester, Maine, and I own Hart Public Policy, and I'm speaking to you in support of this bill today. I have my client, the Dirigo Electric Cooperative Company. The purpose of LD251 mimics a similar bill introduced in the last session, LD1881. Representative Barry was correct. Um, I had to look that up. I didn't have that <laughs> at my fingertips this morning. Um, like that bill, it seeks to have the PUC and the OPA report annually to the Utilities Committee on how it assesses the various public utilities between investor-owned utilities and consumer-owned utilities for the work these agencies provide to each category of utility. It would seem to make sense to have the utilities that are the cost drivers to bear the brunt of those regulatory costs. The COU electric utilities do not expend a lot of time and money at the commission in rate cases or other hearings. So again, it would seem real reasonable that the expenses that are incurred should be allocated and recovered from those utilities that are causing those costs. Um, I did talk to my clients on our weekly conference call this morning and I asked about the time that they had spent at the PUC recently. Um, and really there was not a lot. One of the largest utilities went back to 2016. One of my smallest utilities um, had a few non-controversial, non-contested -con conservation assessment tariffs in 2020. Um, and then another one of the larger utilities um, was a bit more active, but that was as a result of the interconnection to NB Power. Um, so that's what I got off the bat. Um, again, we do support this bill. We supported it last year. We think that it makes a lot of sense. And I'd be happy to answer any questions or get you any more information that you might need from the consumer owned utilities that I represent. Okay, uh, are there any questions from the committee for Ms. Hart? Seeing none, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we'll now go on to opponents and I will recognize Benjamin Sanborn of the Telecommunications Association of Maine. Sanborn. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Lawrence, Representative Barry, members of the committee. My name is Ben Sanborn. I am the executive director and counsel for Telecommunications Association of Maine. Um, we are in opposition to uh, a portion of this uh, legislation, uh, really what our focus is, is on the filing fee issue. And um, Representative Barry uh, raised a number of situations and a number of types of proceedings that occur that uh, can cause the commission to have additional expenses. However, within the communication space, a lot of what we see are uh, recapitalization proceedings. When you're talking about a reorganization, the reorganization is, as defined in statute, is not just one company takes over another company. In the case of a provider of last resort, uh, which is the type of utility that all of TAM's members are, you have a threshold of if you own or are owned by 25% uh, ownership of an affiliate, then that is a reorganization. And similarly, if there is a, a significant impact on your um, management by an entity that has 3% ownership stake in your uh, utility, then that can qualify as a reorganization. And um, the, the real world scenario here is that a company may invest in an affiliate, for example, a broadband affiliate. And in that circumstance, there may be technically a reorganization, but realistically, what you're looking at is a capitalization of resources to attempt to buy more fiber so that you can expand more fiber. And these tend not to be significant proceedings in front of the commission in terms of requiring additional um, outside consultants, which is really what filing fees go to. And so uh, in those circumstances, having an upfront filing fee, understanding that it can be waived and that there are procedures to go through that can be a deterrent for attracting an investor for that sort of recapitalization. And so our only concern with the way in which this is drafted is it creates a, a fairly high number upfront for a uh, investor who may be looking to uh, assist a provider of last resort and their broadband affiliate in getting more um, capital in order to invest in rural areas. And that having a cap or having some clearer connection before assessing a filing fee um, to what the actual activity is going to be at the commission uh, seems to be a little more appropriate. I note that the language in the legislation has two sort of distinct 
areas, one where it may be assessed and one where the commission believes that uh, there will be significant expenses and, or that there will be a change of ownership, I believe, in which case it shall be assessed. And uh, our suggestion would be maybe for the ones where it may be assessed, keep some sort of a cap where if the commission determines that there's not going to be a significant cost, instead of having to go through a waiver process, have that stay at a low level first. And then only if there's going to be a change of ownership, have this sort of higher cap amount. So with that, I have submitted written testimony and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Are there questions from the committee for Mr. Sanborn, Representative Grohowski? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Mr. Sanborn for the testimony. Um, I'm looking at your testimony. It sounded like you had a problem with one portion of the bill, but in your testimony, you, instead of presenting a possible amendment, which I think you were sort of working out there in your spoken testimony, you just said, I uh, urge this committee to vote ought not to pass. If you're able to come back with an actual proposed amendment, I would be interested in considering that, but um, I'm hopeful that we can do better than ought not to pass. Uh, thank you, Representative. I. I will certainly work on that. Uh, this was mostly a timing issue and me having some difficulties with the uh, filing of the testimony to begin with, so it was a little rushed. Um, but yes, I'll be happy to work on some language and bring that back for the work session. Thank you, Representative Foster. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Sanborn, a uh, question I have is, did you present similar testimony last year for the bill that this is uh, crafted after? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Representative. I will have to check. Uh, I am not 100% sure if we did or did not <laughs> file it last session. Um, so I will look into it and I'll have an answer by the work session. Other questions for Mr. Sanborn? Seeing none, thank you very much. And thank you. In the category, no matter how much you prepare for these virtual meetings, um, I now have a uh, cat who wants to come in and a dog who needs to go out. <laughs> so I'm going to turn it over for a moment uh, to Senator Vitelli to uh, take over as chair from the meeting. And we are at the point of having Mr. Parent come up and testify, Eloise, neither for nor against. Thank you, Senator Lawrence. Um, this is very exciting. I'm glad your dogs and cats are keeping you busy. <laughs> so um, we'll do my best to fill in here with David Parent from Maine Water Utilities Association speaking either for or against. David? Good morning. You're there. Uh, let me find my testimony. Here we go. Good morning, Senator Lawrence, Representative Barry, uh, Senator Vitelli, uh, and members of the committee. My name is David Parent. I'm the superintendent of the Sanford Water District, and I'm providing testimony neither for nor against on behalf of the Maine Water Utilities Association. I have submitted written testimony and I ask that you please read it because I'll be summarizing significantly. Our primary message to you today is that water utilities are different than the other regulated sectors. And it makes sense not to paint us with the same broad regulatory brush. First off, there's many more of us is 152 regulated water utilities versus 12 electric, 18 telecoms, four gas, and one water carrier, according to the report that the PUC submitted to the legislature. Secondly, we are much smaller. Our individual revenues are a small fraction of those of most other individual uh, revenues of utilities and other regulated sectors. Water utilities have seen major volatility in both the PUC and OPA assessments over the past couple of years. Assessments have been unpredictable and they do impact budgets when they're unpredictable. This bill, one of our concerns with this bill is that it would separate public and private utilities, creating two smaller pools upon which assessments are calculated. Now, by making the pools smaller, we worry that this would actually increase rather than decrease the volatility of those assessments. So we would, we would like the committee to consider amending this bill to add a mechanism that would stabilize these assessments and decrease the budget impacts. Perhaps using a three-year rolling average 
for implementing some kind of a reserve fund. Um, to limit budget impacts, you could allow water utility the option of paying an increase above a reasonable amount in their next budgeted year. Or you could invoice based on the previous year's numbers and let water utilities know what the invoice is gonna be ahead of their budget year so they can account for it in their budgeting process. We would like the opportunity to discuss these options at the work session if the committee is willing to entertain them. And I was very happy to hear Representative Barry say that, that he is interested in doing just that. So we, we, would, we would love to, to go through these with you if, if you want to, want to hear about them. Um, the association also feels that the, the fees and penalties should reflect cost and intended level of deterrence. We don't think they should be simply raised by the CPI as, as this bill calls for. And you may have different situations in the other regulatory regulated sectors, but I, I don't think that's the case with water. Um, we've also included a suggestion uh, on the reorganization fees in there. Uh, we didn't put a whole lot of detail, but quite honestly, the discussion was, uh, was a lot like the guy who, uh, the gentleman who spoke before me, Ben Sanborn, I think I wrote his name down. I, I don't know Ben, um, but it was the same sort of things that, perhaps that can be structured to uh, more closely represent the actual cost of the reorganization rather than just a percentage. Um, I'd like to thank the committee for the opportunity to testify and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Parent. The members of the committee have questions. I see a hand up for Representative Cuddy. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, <laughs> Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Parent. So do I understand, um, first off, I beg your indulgence, I am new to the committee, so uh, all the different utilities are a little new to me. It sounds to me, and I just wanna make sure that I understand your point correctly, that the, a water utility would, be, would have budgeted for the, for the coming year. They receive the assessment. The, recess, the assessment can be highly variable. Yes. And so you, you may have budgeted for an assessment of, of X number of dollars and receive one significantly higher than that. And so that is that what creates the budget issue you're talking about? That's exactly it. So I can, I can only speak for Sanford's numbers because uh, those are the ones I have in front of me. Um, 2018, the OPA assessment for us was, was about 400 bucks, $399. 2019, it was $2,452, a 514% increase. 2020 was actually good news in the other direction. It was $481, uh, an 80% reduction. Uh, PUC hasn't been quite as bad, but still has been significant increases. Uh, in 2018 to 2019, we saw a 6% increase. 2019 to 2020, a 15% increase. And uh, especially for smaller utilities that run on a very tight budget, when you impact their budget, where the money has to come out of is their capital budget. And that's infrastructure replacement and maintenance. And they just, they need the predictability. If they're not gonna have the money to do what they need to do, they need to do a rate increase. Um, we're lucky enough that we're able to absorb most of these increases in Sanford. It has not impacted our infrastructure budget. Not the case for, for several other utilities that, that we're upset about this. So we're, our primary concern is the volatility of the assessments and, and, and also on, on the uh, fees and, and penalties. We, we don't think those should just keep going up if they're not needed to cover costs or to cause further, further deterrence um, in the water sector. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Parent. And please say hello to your mayor for me next time you see her. Oh, I will. <laughs> That's right, she just came back from up there. <laughs> Other members of the committee have questions for Mr. Parent? Seeing none, uh, I thank you for your testimony. Thank and you. we will now move on to uh, hear from Garrett Corbin from the PUC, neither for nor against. Where's Garrett? There he is. Good morning. Hey, good, morning. Good, morning. good morning. Can everyone hear me uh, this week? It's a little a little better than last week. Okay, great. Um, good morning, Senator Lawrence, uh, 
Senator Vitelli, Representative Barry, honorable members of the Committee on the on Energy Utilities and Technology. My name is Garrett Corbin. I'm testifying neither for nor against LD 251, an act regarding public utility assessments, fees, and penalties on behalf of the Maine Public Utilities Commission. Uh, this legislation requires the commission to apportion the assessments it establishes for utilities in accordance with the share of the commission's resources devoted to matters related to consumer-owned utilities and the share devoted to those of investor-owned utilities, as we've discussed this morning. Uh, under LD 251, the commission would include in its annual uh, report information regarding the portion of our resources devoted to COUs and the portion devoted to IOUs, as well as expenses per dollar of interest rate uh, gross operating revenue for investor owned IOU and consumer owned COU utilities. Our written testimony explains a little bit more about what the bill will do, but in the interest of time, I'm going to just skip forward to um, the, the extra context that we thought would be helpful um, to explain how the commission currently apportions assessments on regulated utilities, uh, focusing on the differences uh, between electric and water utilities as well as some recommendations for possible clarifications to the legislation. Uh, with respect to assessments, the commission currently apportions those uh, first by utility industry sector, so electric, water, natural gas, uh, based on uh, resources devoted to matters in that sector, uh, phone as well, uh, and, and second to each utility uh, within a sector based on annual revenue. So the commission's costs associated with electri electric utility matters, for example, are assigned to the electric industry sector while costs associated with the water utility uh, matters are assigned to that, uh, the water industry. Our written testimony also includes a chart, uh, chart showing the percentage breakdown of the commission costs assigned to each industry for 2020. And then, um, and so that just shows that breakdown. Uh, following uh, the, the allocation by sector, uh, the commission next allocates costs within the sector by revenue. Uh, that leaves utilities with larger revenues paying a higher share of the costs. So for example, the chart in our written testimony reflects that assessments made to the electricity uh, industry on May 1st, 2020 resulted in 96% of the electric industry assessments uh, being paid by the two investor owned utilities, uh, t and utilities, while 4% is paid by the consumer owned t and electric utilities. Uh, for water utilities, that IOU, COU breakdown is very different. Uh, for 2020, 13% of the total assessment was paid for by the investor-owned utilities and 87% by the consumer-owned utilities as detailed in the table that's also in that written testimony. Again, assessments are allocated by revenue. And since the COUs have more total revenue than the IOUs, uh, the COUs pay more of the total cost. Um, so under the provisions of LD251, consumer-owned water utilities would likely see assessments increase as the COUs file more cases with the commission than IOUs, again, in the water sector, uh, leaving more cost apportion to these COUs. Given the likelihood of increased assessments for small water utilities, the committee may want to consider capping year-over-year -year increases to reduce impact on these utilities. The uh, commission would also respectfully suggest that a full year of cost data be compiled before implementation. Uh, that would leave the first assessments reflecting cost apportion to COUs and IOUs occurring in May of 2022. Um, just a couple more points. Uh, the filing fees, uh, the, the bill amends the filing fee provision uh, as has been noted to uh, allow a fee up to 0.05% uh, of the estimated uh, value of the corporation or entity uh, resulting from the reorg. Uh, that terminology is unclear. The committee might consider tying the value to purchase price or transaction value as determined by the commission. Um, and also the bill states that the commission may order a filing fee, except that if the reorganization would result in the transfer of ownership of the utility or its parents, the, um, the commission shall order that a filing fee be paid. And the commission uh, just wanted to call to your attention that we'd assume that any filing fee amount that's not used to process the reorganization application would be returned and that no filing fee would be required if there's no uh, fee needed to process the application, but uh, we would request that that provision be clarified just so everyone's on the same page there. Finally, uh, the commission would suggest that in lieu of uh, having us propose legislation in future legislative sessions, moving forward, the commission uh, might 
rather include in its uh, annual report uh, calculation of all fees and penalties compounded by uh, CPI, Consumer Price Index, since enactment. Um, based on information provided, uh, just the commission uh, finally just um, notes that there might really just be immaterial changes to the COU uh, T&D assessments. And so the commission questions, uh, especially in the electric industry, so uh, just questioning whether the additional significant time uh, for internal staff tracking is justified. Uh, and, and of course, we'd be continued to happy to provide any additional information that would be of assistance to your committee. Great, thank you, uh, Senator Vitelli, for uh, pinch hitting my, while I resolve the animal crisis. Um, I just ask if there are any questions from the committee for Mr. Corbin. Representative Grohowski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Corbin, for being here. I really like your um, green background on your submitted testimony. It reminds me of the good old days in the paper. Um, my question, I seem to recall from two years ago that, and I think you were alluding to this, that the PUC doesn't currently track um, exactly specifically within an industry or a sector, if it's IOUs or COUs or what project it's dealing with. Seemed, it seemed to be that your internal tracking was, as I recall, okay, we're working on electric utilities, but you weren't keeping track of specifically which one. Um, maybe you can refresh my memory on that. And relatedly, um, I'm looking at the bill summary. I don't know if you have it handy, but number three was uh, reporting annually about the tracking um, of resources uh, related to investor and utilities and resources related to consumer and utilities. So were you just saying that that's something that you don't think is um, worth tracking within the electric industry? Was I hearing that correctly? Thank you. Um, you know, whether or not, uh, thank you, Representative Grahowski for the question. Um, you can hear me, right? Yeah. Um, so uh, the whether or not it's worth tracking is uh, certainly you know, in your purview, um, we did just want to highlight the fact that it's uh, would not be an insignificant burden. Um, you know, it's essentially um, just a more detailed, much more detailed level of tracking. And uh, um, correct, we do not currently. Uh, the first part of your question, um, it, we don't currently break down by um, you know or flag our uh, staff time on whether or not the utility is um, uh, on the ownership basis of the utility consumer or investor. It's, um, it's again, it's broken down by, um, by sector and then by revenue within that sector. And I think um, there, there's a view, I think it's fair to say that there's a view within the commission that that um, evens out over time, um, that it seemed to have been a workable balance in the past. Um, but of course, you know, uh, if if there's concerns over over whether or not that is fair, or um, as I know it at the end, you know, we're happy to continue conversations about what a, a fair way to do this would be, um, if that's helpful. Are there other questions, uh, Representative Grahowski? Did you want to follow up? Yes, please. Thank you. Um, would it be possible to look into? Um, your time tracking system. I know that in my job, I literally track by the minute uh, <laughs> each client that I'm working for. And it's just a matter of, you know, clicking that checkbox. Um, and so if you're already selecting, I'm working for an electric uh, utility um, right now, is it harder to select specifically I'm looking at CMP or specifically I'm looking at EMAC? Um, could you, I don't want to like micromanage the PUC, but it just seems hard for me to fathom how um, most of us are used to tracking our time in this way, but it sounds like uh, this is a challenge. Would it be possible to look into your HR time tracking system and see if it's just a matter of simply reprogramming that? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a technical capacity to do it just as someone who's who has been in that world personally, um, there is a, a level of time um, that needs to be devoted to that, you know, minute by minute tracking um, is it takes effort, as you probably know, in itself. And and um, uh, so so there's certainly you know a, a general tracking within the commission. And and yeah, I, I can get back to you with more detail about um, 
you know, our capacity to transition to that. Um, I, I don't, just to be clear, I don't think that we are um, contending that we could not do that transition. It's just a um, question about the, um, you know, on balance, um, the amount of um, additional time it will take to do that. Representative Grawski, do you have any follow-up? You're all set. Um, other members of the committee who wish to ask questions of Mr. Corbin, uh, Representative Barry. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And Mr. Corbin, thank you for your testimony. Um, <clears throat> just maybe as a follow-up for the work session, um, I would be very interested in understanding you know, how someone like the administrative director or you for that matter, who <clears throat> work across multiple jurisdictions do you know, keep track of your time. So if you can give us a little more, you know, uh, concrete visibility into that, um, you know, how you, what, what box you check, um, what kind of a time clock system you have, that would be great. Um, so just to echo um, Representative Grahowski there, but I think another thing for the work session would be helpful um, to understand, which is, um, you know, we've looked at this bill before, obviously, you know, came forward in the last session. Could the, could the PUC, um, provide for us, um, you know, this year, um, you know, we could wait a little, <clears throat> could you provide for us um, that uh, update on fees and penalties, um, you know, if, if they were adjusted to inflation, where they would be now that's contemplated in the bill so that we could consider taking action on those items um, now rather than waiting for the next annual report reading that and then contemplating action in a future legislature. Yeah, that's uh, certainly, thanks Representative Barry. Uh, that is all fair and, and we'd be happy to do that. Thank you. Are there other questions from the committee for represent, uh, excuse me, for Mr. Corbin? Seeing none, thank you very much. And we'll now go on to others who wish to testify neither for nor against uh, the chair will recognize Barry Hobbins, the uh, public advocate. Barry? Barry? We'll give him a minute. I'm sure he's trying to get on. And in the meantime... Um, I'm fine. Thank oh, you. Great. Good. I apologize. Again... Thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, provide testimony, which I have in writing on LD 251. And I just wanted to um, go through a little bit about this information. As you know, uh, the last legislative session um, discussed a similar bill, uh, which has been referenced as LD 1881. Interestingly enough, uh, the hit research that, uh, that we did on the last file, the last filing and the last bill submission, we found that the that there was a concern, especially with the the IOUs and COUs with with respect to water companies. And as a result of that testimony, um, our office voluntarily began to separate out the commercial water companies versus the uh, commercial consumer water companies. And that information uh, is the only information, even though we weren't legally obligated because the bill did not pass, we have been, we have been using and offsetting that. To give you some idea um, of staffing hours, we, sta we basically have, just like I did when I was a lawyer, we keep track of the staff's hourly time. We do an hour, hourly time analysis and that's how we come up with a percentage of what the assessments will be. In our office, the electric companies are 73% of staff time goes to electric, 11% goes to telephone, 18% goes to gas, and 6% of the hourly time, as per our analysis, goes to uh, water. Uh, I would we, my testimony will explain explain many things, but please understand is that we have no objection whatsoever uh, to collecting and reporting the information referenced in this bill. Um, 
I would suggest, though, and when you're looking, don't look at the original bill. Look at the amendment of the committee, which is very thorough and made some vetting changes that I think make the bill a stronger bill. Um, as I mentioned before, we don't track except for water for our fiscal for our fiscal year assessments of 2021. Uh, and essentially any impl implementation would need to reflect a start date for collection. The fiscal year for the OPA is July 1st to June 30th with an annual report due to the legislature and to the governor on September 1st. So clarification as the beginning of the tracking, this information would need to be looked at and clearly stated. Uh, we, have, we have no issue uh, with the rules issue because, uh, quite frankly, um, the OPA does not issue rule, rules. So any reference to its possible issuance of a rule should, not, should be deleted from the bill. Uh, again, we do not have any objections. We would like to work with the committee. I think there is, uh, you will be surprised, uh, and we were, uh, with uh, the split that we we get we estimated from the previous work was 80 percent of the total number of of hours and expenditures um, would be from the the IOUs and 20 percent from the COUs for water water districts and their their assessments will reflect that. Uh, unfortunately, there was another issue with the mechanism of keeping track that we found in looking at the other, the other bill uh, when it was presented to the legislature. And uh, we, that was what precipitated our looking to assess based upon percentages such as that. So there's a basically, ironically, a reduction in the consumer water districts. And I think they'll find that in their, in their assessments and fees. And also, three minutes, thank, you, thank you very much. Any questions at all, I'd be more than happy to answer. My testimony goes into further detail. Thank you. Are there questions for the public advocate from members of the committee? Seeing none, thank you very much. Thank you very much. We'll look forward to working with you in the work session. And uh, Ben, I believe that concludes uh, the people who wish to testify on that bill. Is This bill, is that correct, Ben? That's yeah, what I have. What's that? That's what I have. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, and so I'll declare the public hearing on this bill closed. We'll now go on to our second bill uh, for the morning. It's LD uh, 285, an act to protect utility consumers from investor risk for costs incurred due to disaster. And is again presented by uh, our co-chair on our committee, our representative Seth Berry. Representative Berry. Thank you very much, Senator Lawrence. Uh, members of the committee, <clears throat> um, I am still Seth Berry and I am now presenting LD 285, which is an act to pr protect utility customers from investor risk for costs incurred mm -hmm. due to a disaster. Um, the bill is quite short, uh, but the uh, subject matter that it raises is uh, quite complex. This really goes to the heart of the uh, regulated utility business model. And so um, I'm going to um, take a little time on it um, just to kick us off and um, hope it's the beginning of a robust discussion about our utility business models in general. <clears throat> um, as you know, there are two types of utilities in Maine uh, and in Title 35A, which is our special section of statute. Um, one business model is investor owned, uh, the other is consumer owned. And in theory, each business model has its advantages. Um, one consideration uh, when we think about the advantages of each is risk. Uh, the theory often goes that uh, an investor owned utility um, uh, puts some of the risk onto shareholders. That risk is borne by shareholders um, and that's a benefit. In return for shouldering risk, um, the, the uh, shareholders benefit uh, from the, what's called the revenue requirement, which is used in rate setting. Um, and this revenue requirement, which our PUC uh, determines, includes all of the costs uh, to the shareholders, um, including their corporate taxes, 
as well as uh, a built-in return on equity uh, or ROE <clears throat> on capital investment to provide for a profit. Um, so that's the benefit to the shareholders. And, and again, the, the, the idea is that the, the, uh, the consumers benefit because risk is shouldered by those, uh, those shareholders. Um, in a consumer and utility, in contrast, uh, we bear the risk as, as customers, as rate payers, goes the theory. And um, in return, we don't have to pay extra for those shareholder profits or the corporate taxes that I mentioned. Those are not part of our rates. Uh, it cuts the capital, <clears throat> the cost of capital investment uh, roughly in half, and, and that reduces uh, rates in the consumer and utilities. Um, obviously, these, dif these differences matter enormously. Um, they are directly related to the rates that we pay. Um, so just to put a finer point on this, uh, looking at main uh, utilities, main uh, transmission and distribution utilities, um, as of January of this year, uh, the delivery rates in the IOU world are very, very different from the delivery rates in the COU world in Maine. Uh, our investor and utilities charge 58% more for, their, for what they do, the delivery of each kilowatt hour, 58% more per kilowatt hour than the consumer and utilities of Maine charge. Specifically, um, the average per kilowatt hour is 9.5 cents. And uh, for the consumer and utilities, it is only 6.0 cents. So the question needs to be asked, why are most of us paying 58% more? Um, and in return, by the way, um, based on the IOUs that report reliability to the EIA <coughs> and the uh, Energy uh, and Information Agency of the United States, um, we're getting the worst reliability in the nation uh, from those investor-owned utilities. Um, my belief is that there are several reasons, but one of those is that our theory of risk is not working. It is broken. Um, in practice, the uh, IOU ratepayers are actually the backstop, not the investors. Um, so the risk is not being uh, shared. And this bill is, is one small step to correct that imbalance. The bill would simply require that if investors own a utility, and if that utility is damaged uh, by a storm, if its facilities are damaged in a storm, the cost of repair should fall to investors. So um, let's, let's talk about a, just a different scenario altogether to understand what that means. Imagine that the grocery store that you go to is damaged by a sudden tornado. Do you as the customer pay to fix it or does the store owner uh, uh, pay to fix the damage to their store? Now imagine instead that you own shares in that store. You're both a customer and an owner. The same tornado hits. Do you pay? Of course you do. You pay in direct proportion to your ownership stake. That's how it works in the, the, the real world of business. Uh, if you own it, it's your job to take care of it. You can have insurance, you can have federal assistance, but otherwise you're responsible. Now, because we don't we don't follow this logic in the utility world at present, um, it creates problems. When an IOU is able to shift the cost to ratepayers, not investors, there's less incentive to proactively plan, to maintain and to manage the grid against damages and outages, to prevent those outages to begin with. Um, this is happening in Maine today. Our theory of risk is broken and we're paying more than we should. 58% more, as I mentioned, and getting worst in class performance. Um, Maine, not only uh, based on our IOUs, has the 11th highest uh, electricity delivery rates in the nation, uh, but also the worst outages in the nation. Uh, in 2017 uh, and again in 2019, uh, we had the worst reliability. And I provide some information about that in my testimony. Um, the impact of climate change is going to be making this worse. Uh, destructive natural events are becoming more frequent. Um, we all saw what happened in Texas last week. Uh, we all remember October 30th, 2017 um, in Maine when power was out for two weeks for many Mainers. Uh, seniors were blocked in their driveways, unable to access emergency services. Schools were closed for a week in some areas. These, the, the, the failure to harden the grid has an impact. Um, 
Now the cost to CMP uh, because of that storm, some of which were un unavoidable. Let's, I want to be clear. Uh, you know, you can harden the grid and and still incur a lot of cost, but some of some of the costs were avoidable. The total expenses to respond um, to bring in out-of-state crews to pay for their meals, their lodging, their overtime, their equipment. The total costs were about seventy-seven million dollars, as I recall. And um, uh, I. Uh, I also recall that CMP's shareholders were only required to pay about three million. I want to ask the PUC to, to correct me on that if I'm wrong, but I believe it was 77 in, in total, and the shareholders paid about three million. Um, customers were, in effect, required to pay off the rest. Um, there was a little bit of a of a of a of a trade off because um, there was a federal tax cut that came into play that reduced the corporate taxes of the utility that normally would have reduced our rates because remember we pay those corporate taxes. So um, typically that, that should have gone into a rate reduction. Instead, it, it was uh, used to uh, cover the, the utilities costs. In essence, we paid, for, we paid for all the costs except for uh, the, the first three million or so. It was, it's been added to our monthly bills. Um, and, and, and again, I, I believe that this, uh, much of this was unavoidable. I think that's demonstrably true. Utilities can't control mother nature. Um, and um, it is a, a fair point that uh, CMP and Versant will, will make today, I'm sure, that we have a lot of trees in the state. Um, but let's recall that New Hampshire, uh, which is the secondly most, most forested state, does not have the second worst reliability. Let's recall that Florida and the Gulf, all of the Gulf Coast have multiple hurricanes each year. Um, and let's recall that Nebraska, which has the best reliability in the nation and some of the lowest rates, has about 50 tornadoes per year. Um, I provide a chart of tornadoes, uh, the tornado history in Nebraska uh, in my testimony. Um, again, uh, it, Nebraska, if you, if you don't know it already, is the only state where all utilities are consumer owned, uh, but 49 states have at least some consumer owned utilities. Um, there's a lot that main utilities can do to improve our, our reliability. Um, I wanna talk about a few of those things today. Um, it's, it's, it's important that we understand this uh, on this committee. Um, investment in the, uh, the, the low voltage distribution networks uh, that run down our, our side roads and streets, um, is, it, it doesn't pay as much as high voltage transmission, uh, but, but it, is, it can be profitable and um, all of it needs to be done in a smart, uh, intelligent um, and, and low cost way to the extent possible. Hardening the grid can, can mean a number of things. It can be better vegetation management in some areas. It can be installing taller and stouter poles so that more trees and branches fall under the wires. Um, it means regularly inspecting lines and repairing weak spots. It means installing sectionalizers and reclosers to limit the extent of an outage. It means installing insulated tree wire that doesn't short when it's touched by a drooping branch or better yet, <clears throat> using Hendrix wire or spacer wire, which is uh, far stouter, um, also insulated, but suspended from a, a spacer cable, which doesn't short out and can often sustain the weight of an entire tree. Um, Hendrix wire is a lot more costly, um, but again, there's, there's a return on that investment and it can dramatically reduce outages and, and much of the need for tree trimming as well. Um, <clears throat> I provide more about that in the appendix to my testimony. So um, wh why does this matter? Um, it's not just about cost. Um, let's remember too that uh, it's often the most vulnerable among us who are hardest hit by widespread, long lasting, severe outages. Um, this is not just financial. It can be a matter of life and limb. Uh, last week in Texas, uh, as we all saw, more than 30 people died due to the outages there. Uh, that's the number we know of today. Um, Maine has the worst outages in the nation now, but more severe weather is coming. So we need to get to work to re reinforce our utility system. Um, and, and that is the job of utilities. Um, but our job is important too. Um, it's a, perhaps a little more simple. If we want utilities to perform better, then we need to pay for success. We, do, we should not be paying for failure. And that's what the bill is really about. <clears throat> I wanna be clear, I'm not referring to performance-based rate making. We talked about that last year. There was a bill that we considered and unanimously rejected in the 129th legislature. Performance-based rate making 
um, is, is uh, typically used to increase complexity, increase incentives, more, more carrots to do what should already be done. Um, and over the years, it has inevitably uh, resulted in increased profits at the expense of rate payers. I'm still looking for an expert to tell me where performance-based rate making has been done and has been a clear and net success. Um, I haven't found a good answer to that yet. So what I'm proposing is not more carrots, but simply that we stop asking ratepayers to bear almost all the risk and shareholders to bear almost none uh, and still make a consistent predictable profit. <clears throat> um, now, it, it may be said today that this bill is not constitutional, that it might be a taking. And I wanna ask you, if that is, if that is the case, then are we, uh, uh, is, is this the business model that makes sense for us? Is this what we should continue to do? Because last time I checked the definition of, 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 of madness was continuing to do the same thing again and again and having it not work. Um, it may be said that we need to continue the, the, um, the flow of capital. We need to keep the credit rating high of the utilities. Um, and so we can't do anything that might harm their, their predictable profits. They, then they might have, we might have less access to capital. I think that's circular thinking. Um, it, it keeps uh, the rate payers of Maine on the hamster wheel. Um, and it, it is thinking that's really brought to us by the, um, the IOU uh, industry. Um, an important note here is that our not-for-profit consumer-owned utilities, uh, uh, such as the Deergo Electric members we heard from earlier, but also the, the water folks, do qualify for assistance from FEMA, from the Federal Emergency Management Agency, when a natural disaster is declared. <clears throat> um, only the consumer-owned utilities typically qualify for the FEMA assistance. So one example, um, after Superstorm Sandy, uh, the not-for-profit utility on Long Island uh, in New York was given $878 million. Um, so getting close to a billion there by FEMA to help pay the cost of rebuilding the grid. And obviously that's a major uh, assistance to ratepayers. Um, the, uh, I'm gonna skip on a little bit, but, but um, just quickly, uh, I, I, I encourage you to learn about Winter Park, Florida. Um, Winter Park, Florida decided they, they, they gave up on um, trying to uh, you know, pay for, for uh, utility storm response and not getting good results. Um, they created their own uh, consumer and utility. Um, they've buried all the lines. They have no outages now and the rates are down lower than, um, than in the neighboring utility, uh, which, they, which they took over. Um, the, uh, you know, the, the question before us is whether, uh, we can simply ask the utilities to pay for those costs. But I think, again, we need to consider whether the business model is working if that is not possible. Um, there's no question that we are going to make a big transition. There's going to need to be a lot of investment in the grid, uh, in the next generation, um, starting now. And uh, it's not just a question of cost, it's also a question of equity. Um, the, uh, as I mentioned earlier, lower income Mainers have a very uh, high burden uh, for energy costs in general. And they're also, they also tend to be the most vulnerable um, in a natural disaster. They may depend on oxygen machines. They may not be able to afford a home generator. They may live in crowded housing with no alternative heat source. Um, and of course, I mentioned the 30 or, or, or more who died in Texas recently. I don't think those were wealthy and privileged individuals for the most part. We're still learning their stories. Um, it also has an impact on business. Outages have a real cost to businesses like Ten Texas Instruments, um, where when production stops abruptly because of an outage, and this happens often, um, hundreds of thousands of dollars in product are rendered, rendered unusable. That value is forever lost. Um, and um, Similarly, uh, dairy farms uh, who need to uh, store their milk and, um, you know, have an outage um, can often see significant spoilage as well. In some cases, a generator is affordable. In other cases, uh, certainly for Texas Instruments in South Portland, uh, that would have to be a pretty expensive investment. Um, so we need to hold our private utilities a little more accountable um, and uh, prevent our um, economy from shutting down and uh, customer safety from being jeopardized when the wind blows. Um, I think it's time that we no longer require the captive customers of investor owned utilities to pay the price for the risks associated with severe weather. 
uh, I will um, end there. Uh, thank you for your time and happy to try to answer any questions. Thank you, uh, Representative Berry. Are there any questions from the committee for Representative Berry? Representative Grohowski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Representative Berry, for bringing forward this um, compelling thought. <laughs> I don't know if it's a thought experiment. I think it's beyond that at this point. I appreciate that. Um, I'm just curious, I've been sitting here racking my brain trying to think of um, what risk the utilities do bear um, to get the, and maybe you can remind us what general percent of return they get, um, because it seems like we all pretty much pay our bills. If we don't pay our bills, can they distribute those costs amongst those of us that do? I'm just curious if you have any sense of if there's any risk at all to investing in an electric utility. Thank you, uh, Representative Grahowski. And uh, the short answer is there is very little risk. And um, it does go back often in rate making to that, um, that, that counter argument that I mentioned that if we, if we create risk, then we will jeopardize the, um, the credit rating of the investor owned utility. And that could have the impact of raising rates. So it's a catch 22 that keeps the customers uh, of uh, utilities like CMP or Versant on, on the hamster wheel of profit. Um, the the uh, ROE, uh, return on equity that I mentioned um, for capital investment is built into uh, US constitutional jurisprudence in the, uh, the Hope and Bluefield decisions of the 1920s and 1940s. We have to pay, constitutionally must pay uh, for uh, a very healthy rate of return for capital investment. Performance-based rate making can only add to that. Um, we, we cannot go lower than the profit they're already making. So there's very little we can do with performance-based rate making. Uh, what we need to do is have a spine and um, instead simply say, we're not going to pay when failures occur. Um, or we, if, if, if you won't go along with that, we'll change the business model. Um, I can I can get back to you on on ROE generally, but it's it's typically um, in the uh, in the vicinity of nine percent for um, distribution infrastructure, uh, twelve to thirteen percent um, historically for transmission infrastructure, and um, the utilities generally do a little better than that uh, if you average it out over the years in their their actual profits. Thank you very much, uh, Representative Wood. I'm just trying to uh, understand something that you said, Representative Barry, about FEMA, and that, if I understood you right, consumer-owned utilities are eligible for, for FEMA, but investor-owned are not. And I noticed that you mentioned FEMA, it's in the, the bill. So I'm just trying to understand that relationship. Yes, thank you for that question, Representative Wood. And um, it is a very important distinction, um, typically. And we, we see this not just with natural disasters, but also with um, a, a, a disasters such as the pandemic, um, where municipal and state and tribal and, and some nonprofit um, entities <clears throat> are able to uh, benefit from uh, federal emergency assistance. Okay. Um, for perhaps understandable reasons, uh, the federal government has been historically reluctant to, um, to, to give uh, disaster assistance to for-profit enterprises. Although, of course, as we saw in the CARES Act, there, there was money there, um, but it's, it's, it comes in a different form. And um, typically with, uh, with natural disasters, uh, FEMA assistance is, is really just there for the, the not-for-profits, the, the municipal, uh, uh, governmental, and consumer including consumer and utility uh, entities. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to make sure I understood that. But, and, and yeah, the bill references that. I'm, I'm honestly not sure it needs to, um, but uh, thank you for, for flagging that. I, I think you know, the, um, the point is very important. Thank you very much. Are there other questions from the committee for Representative Barry? <laughs> yes, Representative Cuddy, thank you. Um, thank you very much, Senator. Um, so Representative Barry, uh, looking at the 
the text of the bill, um, it talks about um, costs incurred as a result of a, of a disaster as defined by a particular section of statute. And I was looking at um, a Bangor Daily News story from last June, where after a couple of major storms, um, Versant had uh, a rate increase of a little over three bucks a month for the average customer. CMP had a rate increase of about $2.50 for the average customer per month. Um, and they, these were blamed on two uh, major storms and, and the outages those caused during that prior year. I don't know the section of statute that's referenced. I don't know if you do either, but would those, a, a regular regular storm that causes outages, would that be covered by this? Thank you, Representative Cuddy, for that great question. Um, I think generally speaking, um, the bill would only apply, as you note, um, in, in, in from major storm events. And we actually keep track of, of um, major storm events or major event days uh, in um, the utility world pretty carefully. It's used for reporting reliability, um, Sadie, Safi, and, and Katie, which we'll perhaps get into later. Um, different ways of looking at reliability are, are tracked according to major event days. I, I, I think it's, um, it's important to draw the line somewhere, and this seems to me a logical place to do it. Consumer utilities are not eligible for um, federal assistance, uh, you know, in, from a smaller storm. And I think that the, the, the insanity, if you will, of our current uh, approach to um, uh, you know, sharing the, the costs or, or not sharing them um, it, it is really highlighted when uh, a consumer and utility, which already, you know, has 58% lower rates is by the way, allowed to, you know, qualify for federal assistance and the investor and utility, um, you know, just turns, turns to the rate payers to, to shoulder that cost as well as everything else, you know, um, I, I hope that helps to answer the question. And thank you. It does. Thank you. All well set, Representative Cuddy. Representative Foster. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Representative Barry, for your testimony. Uh, just one question to kind of close the loop on your uh, analogy of uh, the supermarket versus the uh, uh, consumer owned utility. Uh, would you agree that? Uh, in one way or another, eventually the customer pays the bill. Uh, if the investors have to make up the uh, uh, payment of re rebuilding that store, for instance, eventually uh, those buying their milk in there are gonna pay that uh, for that repair. Likewise, uh, would you also agree that main, rate, main taxpayers may feel that it's unfair that a utility in New York receives FEMA uh, monies to make their repairs while taxpayers in Maine have to help contribute to eventually pay for that uh, versus our system of the ratepayers uh, uh, being uh, held accountable for the products that they purchase uh, through future uh, costs. So I, I'm just, you know, you, you make a distinction between whether uh, our utilities, uh, the consumer owned utilities can uh, access FEMA money, but eventually we, we pay one way or another, the, uh, the consumer or the taxpayer. Uh, I guess I'd ask you just to address that if you would, thank you. Thank you, Representative Foster. Uh, there are certainly differences uh, between the two worlds. Um, and I, I, I think the, the groceries, the difference in the grocery store example, the primary difference is that uh, we get to choose which grocery store we go to. And if Shaw's is charging more for um, pineapples uh, than Hannaford is, you know, I, I might go to Hannaford instead. So, um, you know, the, the problem in, 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 in the world that, that, you, that we all live in on this committee is we regulate monopolies. Um, you know, I can't go, um, you know, with, with uh, you know, Madison or Holton or Kennebunk Light and Power or Eastern Main Electric um, as my provider um, to, to try to access that 58% lower rate. Um, you know, my, I, I pay 58% more uh, for, for, for an investor and utility. 
and I get uh, worse reliability for it. And uh, by the way, I have to pay when um, they incur costs due to storm. So that to me is a broken system. And that's what I think we're trying to get at. You know, it is, <clears throat> it's certainly true that, that we help to pay for, for, you know, storm response in Long Island. Um, I, 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 that's the reality. We're not gonna change federal law. I, I'd like to, to, you know, have some of that money coming back to us here in Maine as well. Um, so to me, that's one more, one more reason to, um, to, to either um, pass this bill or um, change the business model altogether. Any follow-up questions, uh, Representative Foster? Uh, no, thank you. Okay, any other questions for Representative Barry? Seeing none, thank you, Representative. So we are at the uh, bewitching hour of just about 10.30, and this is the time when we take a break. Uh, so I'm gonna suggest we do it now. This is a time to give uh, our clerk, Ben Freck, and our analyst, Deirdre Snyder, to catch up on some of the work that has been generated while they're in, while we have been in hearing. So we will be back on at uh, 10.45. I would ask members to please uh, mute themselves and um, turn off their video. Thank you.
Okay, I'll begin uh, welcoming uh, members back to the committee. When I see a at least seven back live, we will start the hearing up again. I see three of us now, four. So just as um, a reminder to people in the audience um, and listening in, this Zoom technology is added a different, different level of complication for us as legislators. Um, we will be um, taking a break at 1230 today, and I doubt if we're going to go all that way. And during all our hearings and work sessions, we're going to be get, taking a break at 1015, 1230, and a similar time in the afternoon. Normally during the legislative process, uh, legislators will spend virtually all their time in meetings, face-to-face -face meetings. We now find we're spending six, sometimes eight hours a day on Zoom meetings. And just the physical strain on people's eyes, on having to be on technology that much. Uh, both Representative Barry and I want to schedule breaks where members can every hour and a half or two hours just stare at something else other than a computer to uh, give their eyes a rest. So I see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine people back. And we're ready to go back to our hearing on LD 285. And I will bring up my list, but I believe the next person uh, to uh, speak is James Cody from Versant Power, who will be speaking against this legislation. James? Good morning, Senator Lawrence and Chairman Barry and members of the committee. Uh, nice to be with you this morning. I am James Cody of Bernstein Shore, and I'm here today on behalf of Versant Power to testify respectfully in opposition to LD 285. Mm -hmm. I want to first point out that Verson Power is committed uh, to be there for their customers, our customers, in the unfortunate circumstance where a disaster confronts the state of Maine. We know we are a vital part of the lives and the health and the economic well-being of people in the state of Maine, and so we are committed to being there in these types of disasters. I've submitted my testimony, so I won't necessarily read all the way through it, uh, but I, I will just make a couple of points. Like all electric utilities, uh, Verse and Power continuously seeks the best possible balance between investment in infrastructure and solutions that increase grid resiliency and reliability, and the impacts that those investments will have on our customers' electricity bills. We do this based on the signals that we receive from policymakers and regulators about where the state's priorities are, and the decisions then are vigorously and appropriately reviewed uh, by the Public Utility Commission as well as other regulators. We believe that in the in the event of a natural disaster, whether it's natural or man-made, a utility's reasonable disaster response would be considered a prudently incurred cost uh, by state standards or federal FERC standards. Um, we also know that all of these costs are thor thoroughly reviewed and vetted uh, in the Public Utilities Commission process in their rate making processes before they are ever approved in, uh, for recovery in rates. The current system, the current standards allow for responsible anticipation of these scenarios under the thorough review of regulators without having to charge customers in advance for risks that may or may not ever occur. And we think that that's important to consider as, as you uh, think through this legislation. The other thing that I wanted to mention, and, and importantly, and I think uh, unfortunately it was a, a byproduct of the events in Texas, was that yesterday FERC announced that it will be opening a proceeding that will examine electric reliability in the face of climate change, uh, which we think will likely have a nexus with some of the issues that uh, LD285 seeks to bring forward. Um, so we look forward to, to seeing what that docket produces. Uh, I, I have not seen all of the details, but there is an announcement on the FERC website along those lines. So for those reasons and others as outlined in the testimony, uh, we would respectfully urge uh, you to oppose this legislation, but we'd be more than happy to answer questions and provide any information that you need for the work session. 
Thank you, Mr. Cody. Are there any questions from the committee? I'm gonna give it a second till I see virtual hands raised. I don't see any hands raised. So thank you very much. We'll now go on to testimony, neither for nor against. And we'll uh, hear, I'm sorry, Representative Barry, yes. You have a question for Mr. Cody? I, I just wanted to check if um, Ms. Newman from CMP wanted to jump in um, in the against yes. category before we go yeah, on. There are. There are two additional people on. Got it. Um, I was told that Ms. Newman is neither for nor against. Is that true, Kathleen? Oh, you are against. Opposition to this one, yeah. Okay, okay. Then we'll continue with opposition and go to Kathleen Newman from Central Maine Power. Thank you, Senator Lawrence. I appreciate that. Um, sorry if I mixed it up when I was submitting my testimony this morning. Um, uh, Senator Lawrence, Representative Barry, members of the committee, I'm Kathleen Newman, Director of Government Affairs at CMP, submitting testimony here in opposition to this legislation. Um, you know, as, as we've discussed, and you, you all know, the utility franchise is premised on the recovery of prudently incurred costs. Per main law, each public utility furnishes safe, reasonable, and adequate facilities and service in exchange for just and reasonable rates. In the regulatory scheme under which we operate, the PUC determines what's just and reasonable by ensuring that rates provide the revenue required by the utility to perform its public service and attract necessary capital on just and reasonable terms and considering whether the utility is operating as efficiently as possible and utilizing sound management practices. There are statutory limitations on what can be collected in rates, contributions for, to politicians, for example, charitable contributions and advertising are not recoverable in rates but all other costs are judged either prudent or imprudent by the regulator. In my written testimony, our lawyers have laid out the constitutional arguments with citations and case quotes that I won't review here, um, except to note that our re rate of return is designed to provide sufficient revenue to cover our total cost of service, which include both our operating expenses and adequate return on investment in property and equipment serving the public. CMP is authorized an opportunity not a guarantee to earn up to a level set by the PUC and in FERC rate, case, FERC and rate cases. In reality, we've not always earned our allowed rate of return. And by way of recent history in 2019 and 2018, our rate of return on common equity did not meet the ROE opportunity of 9.45%. In 2019, it was 5.83%. And in 2018, it was 4.18%. Even where profits are earned, they are typically reinvested. And since 2009, CMP shareholders have reinvested more than, more than profits earned into the system. For example, in the 10 year period from 2011 to 2020, CMP shareholders reinvested 110% into the system. This bill seeks to prohibit the commission from allowing us to recover costs incurred as a result of a disaster, which is broadly defined by statute to include widespread and severe damage, loss of property resulting from any natural and man-made cause, including but not limited to flood, wind, storm, epidemic, extreme public health emergency, or critical material shortage. Public utilities in Maine cannot be denied the opportunity to recover just and reasonable costs incurred related to disasters, such as storms or the COVID-19 pandemic. These events are not within utilities management or control. To prohibit recovery of prudently incurred costs related to such events would violate the constitutional limits of rate making. We encourage the committee to report this bill out ought not to pass. Thank you for your consideration and I'm glad to answer any questions or provide additional information at the work session. Thank you, are there questions from the committee? Seeing none, thank you. We will thank now you. go on to people who wish to testify neither for nor against and the chair will recognize Garrett Corbin of the Public Utilities Commission, Garrett. Hi, good morning again, Senator Lawrence, uh, Representative Barry, honorable members of the committee. The Public Utilities Commission testifies neither for nor against LD 285, an act to protect utility costs, customers from investor risk for costs incurred due to a disaster. Uh, this legislation would prohibit, as we've uh, reviewed the investor owned transmission distribution utilities from recovering in rates any costs incurred by the utility as a result of a disaster as defined in state statute. And a uh, footnote in our written testimony explains the types of situations that are considered under Maine law to constitute a disaster. The main point the commission wishes to acknowledge in our testimony today is that a basic principle of public utility regulation 
requires utilities to be provided with a reasonable opportunity to recover prudently incurred costs and to obtain a reasonable return on investments associated with its provision of required services. A statutory requirement that a public utility incur costs without a reasonable opportunity to recover those costs raises fundamental legal and constitutional issues. That said, uh, we note the commission has not conducted a specific analysis of the legal issues associated with LD 285. Uh, we mainly wish to raise the issue for the committee's consideration. Uh, in addition, the commission notes that the enactment of this bill uh, could potentially create an undesirable disincentive for utilities to incur costs in the course of providing what may be uh, crucial services during the declaration of a disaster. And, and um, I just conclude there, we're happy to provide additional information that would be of assistance to your committee. Are there questions from the committee? Representative Barry. Thank you. Um, Mr. Corbin, can you please um, tell us who is responsible and, and, and I mean, you know, the buck stops here responsible for making sure that our grid is hardened um, against uh, severe weather? Uh, thanks uh, for the question, Representative Barry. I think that is something that um, uh, the commission would look at the utilities prudence, as I mentioned before, um, in, in managing their infrastructure over time. Um, and, and that's something that is, uh, as, as the committee might be aware, the commission's uh, recently opened an inquiry um, to uh, look into that matter specifically as it relates to, um, you know, potential um, what's to come from climate change. Thank you. Are you all set, Representative Barry? And just to follow up on that, uh, uh, Mr. Corbin, I, if I understand what you're saying, I mean, aren't we really all responsible for that? Isn't the legislature responsible as far as public policy to see that our grid is ready to respond? And isn't the PUC also responsible as well as the utilities? Sure, Senator Lawrence. Yeah, I think, you know, it probably might be commensurate with the, uh, the amount of time or the window you're looking at. So, so day to day, of course, would be um, on the utility when you're looking at a, um, you know, decades long um, preparation, that's something uh, bigger picture. And as was noted in previous testimony of uh, FERC is even looking into that on a national level as well. So probably depends on the scale um, or, or scope of it uh, as well. Okay, great. Thank you. Any other questions for Mr. Corbin? Seeing none, thank you very much. And we'll now go to um, our public advocate, Barry Hobbins, who is testifying neither for nor against. Barry? We'll give him a minute to jump on. I think he's here now, Barry. You're still muted, Barry. I think that should be good. Good. Okay, good, thank you. All right, as I said for the third time, <laughs> Mr. Chair and, and Chairman Barry and members of the committee, I'm Barry Hobbins here to testify uh, neither for nor against this legislation on behalf of the Office of the Public Advocate. Uh, this, uh, this issue is a controversial issue, obviously, um, it interfaces with much what's going on uh, through different forums regarding the issue of energy, climate, climate carbon issues. Uh, and it is one that uh, there's no solid answer. I might say that our committee, I mean, our office is the, is the coordinator for non-wise alternatives. Again, this is uh, an opportunity to take um, that, that, that quorum uh, in order to talk about uh, how non-wise alternative issues could play in, in this debate. Uh, I'm not trying to make business or promote the office, but that's something that we would like to look into. We also would like to participate in any type of workshops involving this issue. And uh, there's no right or wrong answer. There is policy issues that this legislature uh, has that uh, goes beyond 
um, the public the Public Utilities Commission are rules or regulations. And this is one issue that you have the final say as long as it meets the constitutional guidelines. Thank you. Thank you. Are there questions for Mr. Hobbins from the committee? Seeing none, thank you thank very you. much. And I will declare this public hearing closed. Again, that is my water bottle because I have not yet um, brought my gavel over from the office. Okay, we're now on to our um, next bill. And uh, that is LD uh, 314. Let me make sure I can bring it up on the screen so I can have it in front of me. It is an uh, act to continue the green power electricity offer. And it's presented by its sponsor, Representative Seth Barry. Go ahead. And uh, good morning again. It is still morning. Uh, Senator Lawrence, members of the committee, um, I'm still Seth Barry, and I'm presenting now LD 314, which is an act to continue the green power electricity offer. Um, this also is one of those bills that was ready to pass. Uh, was it a uh, uh, bipartisan not to pass committee report um, a year ago and uh, died in the pandemic legislative limbo. Um, so um, again, thank you for voting for it before. I hope you can vote for it again. Uh, this is an emergency bill uh, because there's an expiration date coming up on April 1st of this year where the green power uh, standard offer for electricity customers, uh, which is one of the uh, options we make available to main consumers for supply uh, and which supports community-based renewables um, is going to expire. So um, to avoid uh, depriving customers who have uh, availed themselves of this choice, um, we, we would like to simply lift that uh, expiration date I think it was there um, just as a, as a way to, to make sure uh, that the program wasn't having adverse consequences. I, I think um, the program has proven itself. Um, those who are willing to pay a little more for a greener choice uh, have been able to do so through the green standard offer. Um, it's easy to do. And um, this is at this point a proven and, and again, purely voluntary program that supports community renewables. So, um, it's not broken, uh, let's not fix it and let's keep it going. Um, thank you for the opportunity to testify and I'm happy to try to answer any questions. Are there questions from the committee? Seeing none, thank you. And just an informational moment for the two new members to the legislature, uh, Representative Wood and Representative Kudlow. This is an emergency legislation and what that means is Normally legislation um, does not take effect until after we uh, adjourn sign a die, meaning our last day uh, with we adjourn without day in the legislature. And it takes effect 90 days after that point to allow the constitutional provision for a citizen's veto of that legislation to happen before the legislation takes place. In the case <clears throat> of legislation where the the legislature recognizes an emergency where this has to happen within a certain period of time. There has to be an emergency preamble in the bill. So if you look at the bill on page two, there is an emergency preamble explaining why it's an emergency. And then it will need to be passed by uh, two thirds of the elected members of both the House and the Senate um, in order to go into effect immediately before the 90 day expiration. So I did see your hand up, Representative Wood. Does that answer your question? No? Okay, no. did you have a question for Representative Barry? I, I just wanted to understand a little bit more about the green power electricity offer, exactly what that means. Okay, Representative Barry. Thank you, Representative Wood, for that question. Um, so, uh, Maine, uh, as as you uh, as you know, um, and and 
we've all had a lot thrown at us um, lately. So, so if, if, um, if this hasn't become clear, um, that's entirely forgivable too. But Maine, Maine has a, a, a competitive market for supply and um, we make available what's called a standard offer um, where the PUC, uh, for those who do not, do not choose their, uh, their power supplier, uh, the PUC annually um, does a request for proposals and selects from among the bidders to uh, provide uh, power uh, to the bulk of us. I think it's around 80% of Mainers do not choose and are with the default or standard offer. Um, <clears throat> in addition, we can choose from a, a variety of competitive suppliers, um, Zoom, Ambit, uh, Electricity Main. Uh, there, there are many and they're, they're listed uh, and their rates are listed on the Public Advocates website, mm -hmm. uh, which is very helpful. Um, and then in addition to that, we have this, this, uh, a, the separate standard offer or default op offer for those who want a green, all, all, all renewable supply, uh, but really just want to make sure that the PUC procures it. And they'd also like to, by the way, make sure that it's community renewables, that it's not just large grid scale renewables, but it's, it's community renewables, uh, you know, hopefully cited closer to load, uh, bringing some of the benefits that those smaller distributed resources provide. Um, and um, the creation of the green power standard offer was, was really to meet that need for people who wanted something a little easier. They didn't have to, 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 to choose, um, shop around. They, they have the, the benefit that the PUC kind of oversees this program. And by the way, I should have mentioned, this is a commission bill. Um, so thank you to the commission for putting it forward. Um, and, um, you know, it, 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 it has that, that extra uh, community angle as well as being, uh, you know, renewable, renewably sourced. Is that helpful? Yes, thank Great. you. Any follow up, Representative Wood? No, thanks, that's okay. helpful. Any other questions for Representative Barry? Seeing none, thank you very much, Representative. Uh, we will go on to our list as soon as I bring it up of individuals um, wishing to testify on this bill. And our first person in favor of this bill is James Cody from Versant Power. James. Good morning again, Senator Lawrence and Representative Barry and members of the committee. Um, nice to be first at bat here a couple of times in a row. Um, I, again, I'm James Cody with Bernstein Shore on behalf of Versant Power. And I'll be very brief this morning that we are here today in support of LD 314 and wish to thank Representative Barry and the Public Utilities Commission for bringing this bill forward. Versant Power currently has about 500 customers who have voluntarily uh, elected to enroll in this program and the timely passage of this legislation allows us the opportunity to, to limit uh, the amount of disruption possible in terms of uh, making sure that they have a smooth and overall reliable customer experience uh, as this program was set to sunset, but now we might be able to, to save it and, and make sure that that is uh, smooth going forward. Um, we also just wanted to make sure that everyone is aware that the utilities, Versant in this case, does not have a financial stake in this outcome. We are a facilitator of the program. And to that end, we just want to uh, ensure that the customer experience is as smooth as possible. Uh, the main green power program is an available and proven option, as Representative Barry suggested, to make sure that customers who wish to do so can support uh, state policy goals and increase their access to renewables. And for those reasons, we urge your support of this bill. Happy to answer any questions or bring any information to work session. Great, are there questions for Mr. Cody? Seeing none, thank you. We'll thank now you, go on to Melissa Winnie from the Governor's Energy Office. Melissa? 
Yes, good morning. Thank you, Senator Lawrence, Representative Barry, members of the committee. Um, my name is Melissa Winnie. I am the Energy Policy Analyst with the Governor's Energy Office, and I'm here today to provide testimony on behalf of the office. Um, the GEO testifies in support of LD314. Um, thank you to Representative Barry for an overview of the program. Um, it supports the continued development of renewable energy generation in the state by providing these additional avenues to purchase the environmental attributes or RECs, which are renewable energy certificates. Um, these projects supported by purchasing RECs not only contribute to the state's clean energy goals, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, uh, they also support and create workforce opportunities and economic development within the state. Given the voluntary opt-in nature of this program, uh, it really provides the opportunity for Maine people to make their own decision uh, to support renewable energy generation. And this program provides the pathway for them to pursue these opportunities to do so. Uh, in order to continue offering that option and avoid discontinuing the opportunity for those that are already enrolled, the GEO also encourages that the committee pass LD314 in a timely manner prior to the program's expiration on April 1st, 2021, as has been stated. Um, so thank you for your consideration. I will leave it with that and happy to answer any questions or follow up uh, with more information during the work session. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions for uh, Ms. Winnie from the committee? Seeing none, thank you very much. We'll now go on to Stephen Weems of the Maine, uh, of the Solar Energy Association for Maine, will be testifying in favor of the bill. Stephen? Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, Senator Lawrence, Representative Barry, members of the committee. My name is Steve Weems, uh, Executive Director of the Solar Energy Association of Maine. And we enthusiastically support LD 314, including its emergency clause. Uh, just to identify ourselves briefly again, maybe for the last time, um, well, only for the, mainly for the benefit of new members, SEAM is a broad coalition advocating for solar projects of all project types and ownership models. We're a nonprofit main corporation with board membership drawn from municipalities, colleges, conservation organizations, solar installers, community and economic development entities, consumer owned utilities and electricity customers, especially residential customers and members of community solar farms. Now, supporting the green power electricity offer is somewhat outside our lane. Uh, we do so because it is, is a successful program that facilitates several types of renewable energy projects, including solar via a voluntary program that people like. It's a win-win program for green power project developers and electricity customers alike. We've submitted written testimony with a non-obvious interesting example of how the green power electricity offer can facilitate solar projects. We invite you to um, look at that. I'll stop here. Thanks for your service and the opportunity to support LD314, including its emergency aspect. Thank you very much. Are there any questions for uh, Mr. Weems? I don't see any, so we'll go on to the next person testifying in favor of the bill. Um, and that is Barry Hobbins, the public advocate. Barry? Good, good morning again, it's Barry Hobbins. I'm here this morning, Mr. Chair, and Senator and Representative Barry, members of the committee to testify in support of LD314. You know, during this coming session, the committee will consider a number of bills uh, and... Oops, I think you muted again, Barry. Numerous. This particular offer, the green power offer, has no direct cost to consumers unless the consumers opt in to participate. Uh, a close look at this program uh, evidences that this program continues to grow and even throughout the time of the pandemic, 
period when marketing efforts were virtually non-existent, there is a consumer demand for a method to support renewable generation in Maine without the burden of researching or verifying the renewable source being placed on consumers. This product provides consumers with the ability to support Maine-based renewable. I urge the committee to support the, this bill. It is one that absolutely needs um, a provision, a sunset provision to be repealed uh, in order to get uh, consumers in Maine out and understand that this is a good bill and not wait till September when the bill would be repealed. Thank you very much for your time and look forward to any questions you might have or uh, other <coughs> information you might have that you would like my, my office to provide you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Barry. Are there any questions for Mr. Hobbins, Representative Gorhowski? Thank you. Um, if I may, I just want to thank the Office of the Public Advocate for adding information to your website when um, I pointed out that it might be a helpful place for people to find good info about this program. So I just want to thank you for being responsive. Well, we your appreciate website does a great job um, helping regular folks like me and our constituents figure out what exactly is going on in this complicated world. So thank well, you. Well, we're very pleased, uh, Representative, to have a, a conscientious bird dog make good suggestions and we're still working on it. So anyone in the committee feels that they would like to see further information on any topic, we're working at making it even more comprehensive than it is now. And that's one of our obligations is to rate payers. Other questions for Mr. Hobbins? Seeing none, thank you very much. We we'll go you. on to the last individual uh, testifying on this bill. It's Garen, Garrett Corbin of the PUC who will be testifying in favor of the bill. Garrett? Great, good morning. Uh, once again, Senator Lawrence, Representative Barry, and honorable members of the Energy Utilities and Technology Committee. My name's still Garrett Corbin. I am uh, testifying last again, but this time on behalf of the uh, PUC in support of LD314, an act to repeal the sunset of the green power offer. Uh, the program, as has been noted, uh, allows customers to choose locally generated renewable energy, such as wind, hydro, and biomass for their home or business. Uh, just to quickly provide some background, the program's genesis came about during the 2009 legislative session. Uh, the legislature enacted an act to establish community-based renewable energy uh, a pilot program at the time. Um, and uh, Part B of that act required the commission to arrange for a green power supply offer and administer a competitive process to select the provider of that offer. Uh, the design and implementation of the program and resolution of all the issues regarding the transmission and distribution uh, T&D utilities billing service arrangements uh, took some work and time. And ultimately, the program uh, known as Maine Green Power was officially launched in April of 2013. Um, I just, a uh, side note here, uh, mainegreenpower.com, it's, it's just M-E for Maine, so megreenpower.com uh, has a lot of helpful information on it as well. Um, and, and if you uh, add slash FAQ to that website, uh, it takes you to their frequently asked questions page. And um, there's also a lot of good information about how it works there. Um, but just to uh, elaborate on that myself, uh, through this program, the customers have the option to match all or a portion of their existing uh, electricity use with a new renewable energy produced in Maine through the purchase and retirement of RECs, as has been noted, or re renewable energy credits. Uh, Maine Green Power customers voluntarily pay a monthly premium equal to $8.95 for one block of renewable energy uh, that's equal to a megawatt hour which is added directly to their electricity bills and customers uh, are allowed to participate in half block or multiple uh, block levels even. Uh, looking at the more recent history of the program, uh, despite the fact that coronavirus related considerations severely restricted uh, the program's outreach efforts uh, to new customers during 2020, Maine Green Power still continued to grow by almost 17, uh, seven, excuse me, 7% in total number of participants and more than 16% in total megawatt hours of renewable energy supported. Uh, so uh, um, just finally to double down on why the legislation uh, contains this emergency preamble, um, pursuant to the uh, current statute, it's Title 35A, Section 3212A, Subsection 3, the uh, program will be repealed 
again, as has been noted on April 1st, which is just over a month away. Uh, and, and, you know, enacting legislation within a, a month is, is uh, I think it's safe to say a tight window, which is why we were hoping to have this passed last year and why we needed to put, uh, as Senator Lawrence um, uh, really helpfully explained why we needed to put the emergency preamble on this uh, this year. Um, of course, the bill died last year due to the um, session timing, and the pandemic, um, uh, at least that's our view. So the um, without this authority extended, the utilities will not continue the program. Uh, the customers will be removed beginning April 1st and we'll have to create it again from whole cloth. Um, again, while there's a cost to participating customers, there's no cost to ratepayers as a whole associated with the program because those cu uh, participating customers choose to on their own volition participate. Uh, and given the strong demand to date, we expect the program will continue to grow. It appears to provide a valuable option uh, for electricity customers to voluntarily support the development of renewable energy in Maine with modest demands on the commission customers and utilities. Um, so I, I guess just in closing, we'd be happy to continue to work uh, with you on this bill uh, to answer any questions and to paraphrase uh, the way uh, uh, the sponsor represented Barry uh, closed, you know, if it ain't broke, uh, he, he said, let's continue it. I'd say, if it ain't broke, don't kill it. Great. Other questions for uh, Mr. Corbin? Seeing none, thank you very much. I'll now declare the uh, public hearing on this matter closed. So we are back on Thursday, Deirdre, is that correct? And I believe for more public hearings, correct? Yes, we're back Thursday. And as a reminder to the committee, um, the joint hearing in AFA is tomorrow at 10 a.m. for the portions of the biennial budget under EUT's jurisdiction. Okay. And anything else, Ben or Deirdre, we need to know while we're on um, for scheduling purposes? Just Deirdre's email about the 12th. Okay. Yeah. So um, if anybody, everybody can get back to me on that, that would be great. Sorry, are we still live streaming, Ben? Yeah, I can shut it down now. Okay, why don't you shut it down? And Nicole, we're just talking about uh, kind of organizational procedural stuff right now.